just yet Down the path of forgiveness Salvation's waiting there You built a mighty fortress Ten thousand burdens high Oh, love is here to lift you up It's here to lift you high having a little bit of fun up here, huh? You guys ready to join us and have some fun too? We're glad you're here to worship with us. Let's worship together. Stand up. All of the scars. 
just feel that freedom if um, hopefully you guys are just here excited to worship together if you are new here we are so happy you are here this is what church is all about we're celebrating what who God is and uh, what the Bible says is true and so uh, we are so glad you're here uh, my name is Julianne I get to work here with outreach and missions and it's just a joy to be a church family and gather on Sunday mornings and worship together and tell stories uh, a couple of things is that on your way in we ask that everyone's picks up their sermon notes so you can follow along as well as the communion elements today is a communion Sunday and we'll be doing that earlier in the service so for our live stream folks if you're on watching, just remember this is a communion Sunday if you want to prepare those elements and have them ready to go. Uh, we also have our connect card, and that is just a really a uh, simple way for us to know who's here. We can uh, check if you have any questions about the church, if you have questions about a relationship with Jesus, as well as your prayer requests. And for our regular attenders, we drop those uh, in the baskets at the back of the sanctuary. And for our live stream people, uh, we'd love for you to fill that form out online. And either way, if you're new, we'd love to meet you. And so we have a, a team at our guest center in the main lobby with if you're here in person, we'd love to connect with you, answer any questions, and also we have a gift for you. So that's what uh, our setup is for Sunday morning. And another thing at Westgate Chapel that we do is we just love to tell stories for God's glory. We love to highlight what God is doing and uh, share 
people's just real life journeys. And so I have Mindy here with me this morning and you guys will recognize Mindy. She has been attending Westgate and a member for many, many years, 20 years. And she has been working in corporate healthcare and serving here. You've probably served beside her if you've been here for a while. Uh, she's been taking classes, training, equipping. Uh, part of perspectives and EE and things like that. And so over those years, she's just been walking faithfully with God. And um, the story we're going to pick up is in 2018. So you were in corporate healthcare working. And what does God start doing in your life? Yeah. So in 2018, um, I was in healthcare for 26 years and just lost my passion for that. And I just kept praying, Lord, what's next? I wanted to go into ministry, but what did that look like? I didn't want to have to go back to school, didn't want to have to raise my own support, so just kept praying, what would that look like? And um, then I got more speci specific, sorry about that. Um, Lord, I love you, I love sports, what can you do with that? And then a couple months later, um, I'd met Kristen, my friend Kristen. Um, she was a head coach at UT's softball uh, team, and... Um, we started to get to know each other. She actually went to Westgate. And um, she'd been praying for a chaplain for her, her softball team. She grew up with FCA, um, and she'd been praying for that. So I thought, all right, Lord, this is cool. So I contacted the local office and went through the orientation, and um, that's how I got connected with FCA, because otherwise I wouldn't have got connected with FCA. And so um, a few months later after that, the office contacted me back and said, hey, we have an area rep position open. We think you'd be good. So I applied and uh, started raising funds. And uh, here I am. So FCA is the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. That's an international organization that just believes exactly like what we're doing, the church being the church, but they are actually able to go into schools and have different means instead of just inviting people into the church. We're going to places where people are, and so you are working for them as a parachurch ministry, and will you tell us a little bit maybe just the way that they make disciples who make disciples, their model, as well as where you are actually specifically working since you started uh, this, new, this new job over the last year. Yeah, so we are an international ministry, and uh, we've been around since 1954, and our vision is to see the world transformed uh, by Jesus Christ through the influence of coaches and athletes, and then we want to bring coaches and athletes into a saving relationship with the Lord, and then get them plugged into church. And uh, we, we're able to go where a church can't go. So we're just like another club on campus that we're able to, um, to reach them and to minister to them. And uh, really, we want to go to and through the coach because two most powerful words in the English language, coach says. So coaches have a lot of influence. And uh, Billy Graham also said, coaches will influence more kids in one year than you and I will in a lifetime. So we have a method. We want to make disciples who make disciples. Um, it's engage, equip, and empower. And that's just a circle, a cycle that we go through with coaches and student athletes that, uh, yeah, that we get to build a relationship with them. Awesome. So you're at six schools in East Toledo, junior high and high school, yep. and that's kind of your territory, and you've been doing these huddles. And so can you just share just the fruit, maybe what you've seen God doing, even just in this last school year, this last season alone, where, how is God working through you, your ministry, and in these schools? I'll tell you what, he's been moving, wow. and uh, that is just, it's been so awesome just to sit back and see him move. So huddles our Bible studies uh, for student athletes and coaches on campus. And my school's on the east side. You see some pictures up there. Um, I have a huddle. We have huddles started, a multi-sport huddle in each school. Um, we started off in two in the fall. And even in the midst of COVID, uh, we've grown to seven. And so, yeah, yeah. And so those are just multi-sport huddles. And we can also do team-specific huddles as well. But it's been really cool um, to see the fruit. Uh, like Julian said, last month I had a school huddle start and one person called in through Zoom and I was like, oh Lord, 
one person. Okay, that's okay. Um, but I got to talk with Gavin about what it means to live life 100% um, for God and what his sacrifice meant. So I got to pray to receive, with Gavin to, to receive Christ. And so that's been pretty cool. And so, yeah, so the next week. In January, this yeah. last month. Yeah. Gavin so said. Um, the week after, again, same huddle, one person. Um, her name is Katie. And Katie is on her second ACL tear. And she's not able to play basketball this year, which she's bummed out. She had a friend, or has a friend in Kansas City, that has been able to minister to her. So she heard about the Zoom call that we were having, and she linked in, and uh, again, able um, to share with her the gospel, and she prayed to receive Christ as well. And yeah, and the, you know, we're, we're able then to get them plugged into a local youth ministry so they can um, continue their journey in learning more about um, what it means to live for Christ. So, yeah, so God has been moving. It's been wonderful. Yeah, it's been awesome to hear these stories of people knowing that they're making this decision. Mindy gets to stand in these spaces, even though she's used to full classrooms of students, even just online on Zoom. Uh, she can pray with them and then connect them, and we just get to keep walking with people. And so the reason I was so excited to share Mindy's story is lots of reasons, actually. But I just love that Mindy is faithful. She's like, I love sports, and I'm surrendered to Jesus. And the doors that he's opened uh, has just been really, really cool to walk with you. And we, as our church, love sending our people out. And so some of you guys go, We actually many of you are involved with FCA, and there's fruit in many of the schools all around uh, our community, thanks to you guys, and um, but also we love supporting our people when they do enter ministry, and so we call these our partners, and Westgate has many different partners. We have local partners like Mindy. We have local organizations that we support, as well as uh, international workers that we support as our partners, and so I just wanted to make sure you guys knew about her. You get to hear her story. We want to pray for her ministry, and we want to keep uh, sending our people back out, and we pray every second Thursday of the month. If you ever want to join us for our missions prayer gathering, and get all the updates on all of our workers that are out serving uh, the Lord. And so we're celebrating that today, and we're just celebrating people walking in faith. And so with that, we're going to pray ourselves back into musical worship, if you guys will join me. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Mindy. We thank you for the ministry uh, that she's just walking in faith and obedience, who you made her to be, and that uh, you are bringing people to yourself through her. She is just being available, and you are... Uh, you're using her, and that's the life that we want to live as followers of you, Jesus. We want to be disciples who make disciples. We want to uh, just be open to whatever you have for us. And sometimes that's a career change, and sometimes that's just a bold first step, a, a statement of showing up. And so, Lord, we pray as we uh, come to you this morning, as we worship through song and through learning and uh, fellowship, that we will just connect with you, that we will dream with you, that we will listen to you, that we'll surrender to you, and that um, that's where the freedom comes, and that's where this abundant life comes. And so we thank you for the fruit of ministry and our partners and all the people in this church. God, there's much to, to celebrate, and uh, it's all for your glory. So we love you, God, and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, and we get to celebrate the things God's doing and hear these faithful stories of his followers. Amen. Would you guys stand and join us as we continue? You came from heaven's throne Acquainted with our sorrow To train the dead we Your suffering for our freedom. Oh, Lamb of God, in my place, your blood poured out my sin, erased it was my day.
As we get into our message this morning, we're going to be taking a look at the law, a little bit at the law in the Old Testament. And a part of that law that was given in the Old Testament was the sacrificial system. It was a system by which as people sinned, that the way that their sins were forgiven was be that a lamb would be taken that lamb would be sacrificed on an altar to cover over the sin of the people, to literally take their punishment. And it's interesting when you read uh, kind of the history behind the sacrificial system, you read that there were different times throughout the year, especially in Jerusalem, when they were celebrating different festivals or different things, that there often would be these great sacrifices that would take place in the temple to cover over the sin of the people. And historians would note that at times there would be so many lambs that were being sacrificed by the priests that as they would sacrifice it, that literally they would be wading through ankle deep blood that was in the temple court where they were making these sacrifices. All of this to cover over the sin of the people. The beauty is, is that when we sing a song like this about the Lamb of God who has taken our place, so we have the opportunity to worship God and thank him because he is the one true, pure, spotless Lamb who gave his life so that we could be restored in our relationship with God. That old system passed away and Jesus has taken our place, our punishment, our penalty so that we could be restored to God. And today we're going to celebrate that by the taking of communion together. I encourage you to pull out your elements. And uh, again, please, uh, please join us in this time. This was a, 
The Lord's Supper was a thing that was instituted by Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. As he met with his disciples soon before he would go to his death, he wanted to give them an example and a picture to hold on to that would be a constant reminder for them of all that he had done on their behalf. And so it says that Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, that he took bread and he broke it. After he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. A picture and a symbol of the punishment and the pain and the suffering that he was about to endure, not just for his disciples and followers, but for all people for all time. As we take this together, we remember his sacrifice. So let's take it together in remembrance of him. The account that is given in 1 Corinthians is also tells us that in the same way that Jesus took the bread, that he took a cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. And he called on the people to, again, to take it, his disciples, to take it in remembrance of him, his blood that was shed. Another thing that we'll talk about in our message later on in the service is the fact that when Jesus' blood was shed, not only did he take our punishment, not only did he take our sin, but he also gave us his righteousness. The Bible tells us that when God looks at us, he no longer sees our sin, but he sees the blood of his son that covers our sin, and he sees his righteousness. That is a beautiful gift that we have been given. And so when this was instituted, we were reminded that as we take it together, that what we have is a beautiful representation of the new covenant, that through the blood of Jesus, our sins are completely forgiven and we are stored in our standing before the Lord. Let's take together and worship him. Father, thank you. Thank you for this gift that you have given us in Jesus Christ. And as we will sing in just a moment, Father, you are worthy. Thank you, God, for giving a gift that we did not deserve and one that you've given so freely to restore us to you. Father, as we sing, may these words not just be words that come from our mouths on a regular basis, but truly, God, may it be the reflection of our hearts. You are so worthy of all of our worship and all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory
mercy, Christ before me, Christ behind me. Your loving kindness has never failed me, Christ before me, Christ behind me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can be together. Lord, those that are here and those that are watching online, Lord, we just bring these praises to you. We thank you, Lord, that as in your word says that you are before us and after all things and that, Lord, you hold all things together. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray now for those that have heavy hearts this morning, Lord, that, that you would allow them to sing praises, Lord, that you would be through them, that you would uplift them. And Lord, even those who are not in the valley, Lord, those that are on the mountaintop, we thank you. We thank you for the joy that you give us each day. We have so much to be grateful for. Lord, help us to pick up and to follow you. Help us to answer that call that we may lead more, to, more people to you, Lord, that they would see Christ through us. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. I know in my own life, I've seen your faithfulness, and I know that you will continue to be faithful, and we can trust you with that. Lord, help us to remember that. Please open our hearts and our minds for your word this morning, for the message that's prepared for us. We love you and give you the praise and all the glory in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family. It's good to be here with you again this morning. We're going to jump right into our message. If you have got your sermon notes, I'd encourage you to pull those out. And uh, you can use them to follow along as well. If you've got your Bibles, would love for you to turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to center ourselves here uh, in a few verses together this morning. But uh, we have, if you weren't with us last week, we have been going and begun a new series. Pastor Mike kicked off last week. Uh, we're going to be talking over these next many weeks to Together about what it means to be a disciple of, of Jesus Christ and what discipleship in the Christian life looks like. And so this series that we kicked off is entitled Follow Me. And uh, Pastor Mike looked last week at the passage of Scripture where Jesus begins calling his disciples and he is inviting them into a relationship with him. And he noted two points right at the beginning of trying to help us to understand what it meant when Jesus called on people to follow follow him. And two of the points that he made is this. He said that the call to follow Jesus was a call to die, but also a call to live. A call to die. In other words, to die to self and the things that we desire for ourselves out of this world and out of this life, but a call to live and to move into the newness of an incredible relationship that God has designed for us to live as his followers. And it's interesting, as I was thinking about this idea of a call to to live and a call to die, one of the things that really struck me is that I've noticed that in our world today, many people get hung up on the idea that following Jesus Christ is a call to die. I've talked with many people who don't have a relationship with Christ, who aren't Christians, who they actually get hung up on this idea of dying to self. They look at the Christian faith and they see it as merely this system of rules that somehow you have to follow in order to be good enough for God. And they get this idea often from how they view the church. They look at the church and they'll see often one of two things coming out of it that they use to, to explain what they see. One is they will see some Christians who are living their lives in such a way that they are seeking to follow a certain set of rules and expecting that everybody else will follow those same set of rules. And while they are striving to be good people, they often are not actually living out the love that they see in Scripture. And so they look at it and they go, why would I want to follow a set of rules like that where the people that claim to follow Jesus don't even follow what they believe and yet then they will also see other people in the church, people that I have experienced, people that I have talked to, people that, uh, not only people, but also I myself have experienced, where many Christians will live the Christian faith in such a way that they are trying to follow a set of rules and struggling with the idea that they can never match up and never quite be good enough for God. 
And when people look at that from the outside, they look at it and go, what is this rules-based faith that you're living by? And why would I want anything to do with it? They get hung up on the idea of a call to die and often what they don't recognize. And I would say sometimes even for us in the church is that we forget that we haven't been called and invited into a relationship to follow Jesus Christ merely to follow a set of rules, but truly to enter into a -a one-of-a-kind, incredible relationship, the likes of which this world has never seen with our Creator. And this morning, as we continue in our series, Follow Me, I want us to dig a little bit deeper and begin to unpack this idea of this relational call to die to self, to live for Christ, and to truly look at, is it about following the rules Or is it really about this incredible relationship with God? To do so, we're going to take a look together at Matthew chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there with me. We're going to look at just a few verses this morning, verses 17 through 20 together. Now to give you a little bit of background as you're turning there or flipping there on your Bible app, Uh, I want us to understand that Matthew chapter 5 all the way through chapter 7 is considered the Sermon on the Mount. It is one of uh, five major sections, uh, major uh, messages that we will see in the uh, the book of Matthew. It's Jesus' first major sermon that is recorded here in the Gospels. And the Sermon on the Mount, what it does in its entirety is it describes the kind of life that followers of Jesus should live in light of the new covenant in light of the fact that Jesus has come into the world. And what we see in context is that Jesus, here as we get into our passage, has uh, already called his first disciples to follow him. He has also been going around in the northern Galilee region, preaching and teaching, preaching the good news of the gospel of the kingdom, been teaching people about God and about that kingdom. He has also been, uh, while proclaiming the gospel, he has also been going and he has been healing people all over the place, healing lepers healing, uh, giving the blind sight, making the lame walk, casting demons out of people. And as he does these works in the Galilee region, uh, the passages in chapter 4 that precede our passage this morning tell us that his fame is growing rapidly and spreading. People are hearing all over the place about this Jesus who has come and is who is teaching in ways that they have never heard before with such authority, but also who is healing people. And so what we we understand is that there were large crowds of people that were seeking to find Jesus. And in our passage here in Matthew chapter 5, it tells us that Jesus has a crowd that it has come and he is going to teach them. Now, here's the makeup of this crowd that has come. The makeup of the crowd is three, one of three people. One, there are some people that have merely begun to hear about the things that Jesus is doing. And as they've heard these things that he's doing, they are super intrigued. They want to not just hear about the miracles, they actually want to see them. And so they've come because they want to kind of scope it out and they want to be a part of what's going on. So they're kind of there and intrigued and listening. They're not really following, but they want to know more. Then you have people that have been around Jesus. They've heard his teaching. Maybe they've, they've seen one of his miracles physically, or maybe they've experienced it themselves. And they haven't quite decided yet to follow Jesus, but they're kind of in that, like, they're leaning towards it and they're engaging and listening to more of what he has to say as well. There's a third type of people that are there, and those are the people that have truly chosen to follow him. And we see at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus calls his disciples and the crowd to gather with him, most likely on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee on a hillside where he will preach the sermon, a sermon that describes the kind of life that followers of Jesus should live in light of the new covenant. And I want you to read a portion of this with me here as Jesus comes in verses 17 through 20 and he begins to give a comparison to what God truly desires from people compared to what the teachers of the law of that day were teaching people about what it meant to follow Jesus. Look with me at Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. It says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not even a dot 
will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I want you to think about what Jesus says here for just a moment. He begins in verse 17 by saying, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. One of the things we learn as we read in the New Testament is Jesus had a pretty uh, hairy relationship, if you will, with the scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. They, and what Jesus is actually doing here in this passage is he was often accused by the Pharisees of coming and changing the law of the Old Testament, right? The Mosaic law that had been given, the set of rules that people were supposed to follow, he was accused of changing them. And because of this accusation that not only has come already, but will continue to come throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus makes abundantly clear and says, do not think that I have come to abolish it or to get rid of the law. I have not come to abolish it. I have come Come to fulfill it. And he makes his point abundantly clear by telling them, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. So the law is not relaxed. But then what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, is the part that really sticks out to me and that I want us to focus on this morning. He says to the people, I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I want you to think about the depth of that with me. Your first fill-in in your notes this morning is this, is that the scribes and the Pharisees were considered to be the standard bearer for righteous living, for living the righteous life. Who were the scribes and the Pharisees? They were the teachers of the law. We understand from history that they were the ones that controlled the synagogues and the teaching that would take place, the place where uh, the Jews would come and they would worship, where they would study scripture, where they would pray together. The Pharisees also exercised an incredible amount of control over the population. The historian Josephus says that we were about, there were probably about 6,000 Pharisees at the time of Jesus. And we know that they, they carried this incredible weight over the people because what they had done is they were calling people to live in a way that they would earn God's favor and salvation. What the Pharisees literally taught was that God's favor and salvation was something that had to be earned by the way that you lived. And the way that you were supposed to live was in accordance with this, with the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law in the Old Testament has 613 laws that they identified that the people were supposed to follow. And as you followed them, you would earn your favor or salvation with God. But what's interesting is it wasn't just the 613 laws in the Mosaic Law. Because the Pharisees also wrote some laws to go along with those. They wrote those laws because what they wanted to do was to create an even greater barrier to make sure that the people didn't even come close to breaking the Mosaic Law. And so what you have is that they wrote these rabbinical, there were these rabbinical writings called the Midrash that expanded the law. I want to give you an example of what that might look like. I often will ask my kids, and maybe you've done the same, to clean their room, right? Let's treat that as one of the laws, right? Uh, you are to clean your room and to keep it holy, set apart, completely clean, right? Now, when I I say that, I have an understanding of what that means. But I also know that if I tell my kids to go clean the room, what's going to happen? Oftentimes they might pick up one or two things, but I'm still going to find things shoved underneath the bed, shoved in the closet, laying on the floor. Things are not going to be done to the standard with which I believe they should be done. And so what am I going to do? I create my own midrash for my kids, right? I tell them, my expectation is of a clean room is this. I want your bed made. I want all of your clothes and the laundry taken downstairs and put into the, uh, into the actual laundry and get them done. I want you to pick up all trash. I don't want anything thrown in your closet. I want your toys put away where they belong. Not to mention, please don't leave your stinky shower towels laying on the carpet. I would like them also to be taken down to the laundry room. And by the way, how about I just add a few more rules? Like, don't even go into your room unless you
you've showered in the last 24 hours because I know you're stank and I don't want it in there, right? Or maybe I look at them and say, you know what? Actually, better yet to keep this room clean. Why don't we just take everything out of it and all you get is a bed in there, no sheets, nothing for you to get dirty. We just want to keep this as clean as possible, right? I want you to think about what the, the Pharisees did with the people. There were 613 laws in the Mosaic law. And one of those laws was that they were to keep the Sabbath holy. In other words, what God desired of the people was that the, the Sabbath was meant to be a day of rest and a day of spiritual renewal, where they would cease from all of their work and truly rest and worship God. But the Pharisees, in order to make sure that nobody even came close to breaking this law, added to it 39 other laws, which also had laws within themselves to keep the people from it. They had this huge list to follow. So one of the laws was, in order to keep from working, you are not to plow on the Sabbath. But that was defined in many different ways. In other words, one of the things that they said is, be sure not to drag a chair through the dirt. Why? Because if the leg goes and it plows in the ground, it creates a place where a seat could drop. That's working, and you have then broken the law. That's craziness. They also had things like this. You can only take so many steps on the Sabbath. You can only actually carry things inside of your home, not outside of your residence, otherwise it's work. And if you do carry something, you can only go a distance of six feet or else you're working. You can't take a bath. That's definitely work. It's something is spilled. You can't clean it up. That would be work. I mean, can you imagine the crazy list that they created for people to follow? And the reason is this. The Pharisees were considered to be the standard bearers for living the law to perfection. Not only did they help to write it, but they also were the ones that everybody looked to as the standard by which they should live their lives. And these Pharisees received the biggest criticism from Jesus in all of Scripture. They made it impossible, Jesus says, for people to actually come to God. Because if you didn't follow the law, you weren't pleasing God, you weren't earning favor, and you could not achieve salvation. Look at what Jesus says to them in Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13, this is how Jesus addresses the Pharisees. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. In other words, you make it impossible for them to get in. You won't go in yourselves and you don't let others enter either. A few verses later, you'll see this also on the screen in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 through 28. Jesus says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. You are beautiful on the outside. You've, you've got the list down, right? You're following the law. You look great on the outside. But you are filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people. But inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. What I find interesting is that Jesus' uh, condemnation of the teachers of the law of that day was, was harsh in so many places. But think about what he says to the people who have been living under this system of, I need to appease God and live according to law in order to gain favor. Look at what Jesus actually says to them in verse 20. He says, I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, exceeds it, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Think about the weight of the bar that is set. What Jesus literally says, fill this in your notes, is that you need to beat the gold standard, not just meet the standard. You need to beat the gold standard, not just meet it. It would be like this. If I were to tell you to go out and I want you to be a better quarterback than Tom Brady. Now I know anytime we say the name Tom Brady, there are these feelings of like disgust and that, that well up within our soul, right? We hate the fact that he's going to play in the Super Bowl later today and have a chance to win another uh, championship. Maybe some of you love the guy. Other people, not great feelings. But no matter how you feel, 
You have to acknowledge that Tom Brady is, if not the best, one of the best quarterbacks that have ever played the game in the NFL. I want you to think about all of the things that he has accomplished in his career. He's the winningest quarterback in NFL history, 230 regular season game wins. He has 33 postseason wins. He's the only quarterback in the NFL to win more than 200 regular season games. He has the 33 postseason wins are more than twice than any other quarterback that has ever played the game. He is also the only quarterback to win all 16 games of the regular season in one season. He has 14 Pro Bowl selections. He's been league MVP three times. He has, today, will be his 10th Super Bowl appearance, and he has won the Super Bowl a record six times. He has a record four Super Bowl MVP awards, and he holds nearly every major quarterback record, combined passing yards, attempts, completions, and touchdown passes. I mean, Tom Brady is an incredible quarterback. What would it be like for me to look at you and say, I would love for you to go out and be better than that guy. You'd think to yourself, how in the world do I do that? You don't like Tom Brady? I want you to think of another person. Think of somebody like Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps is considered to be one of the greatest Olympians, if not the greatest Olympian of all time. This is a man that in swimming has 28 total Olympic medals. 23 of those are gold medals. One is silver and four are bronze. He is the most decorated Olympian in the history of sport. He also has 82 total medals that he has gained in his lifetime in all of international competition. He's the world record holder in the 400 meter individual medley. He's won more medals than 161 countries. He is considered to be one of the greatest athletes of all time. Now, if I asked you to go out and to try to swim, and to swim better than Michael Phelps. You'd look at me like I was crazy. Most of us, we're lucky if we can cannonball into the pool and swim ourselves to the edge, right, without drowning. Think about what it would have been like when Jesus looks at the people who have been living this life believing that what they need to do is follow a set of rules in order to be pleasing enough to God. And the gold standard is the religious leaders. Jesus says, you need to beat the gold standard. You need to have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. Could you imagine how defeated you would possibly feel in that moment? And I want you to think about this as we relate this even to ourselves today. I have this thought. Does our righteousness today exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees as we read about in the New Testament. I'm not going to even talk about when it comes to issues of sin. I want to simply talk about three areas of how we practice our faith as Christians. One, church attendance. Statistics show that 56% of Christians only attend church two times or less every month. Statistics show that Christians, when it comes to reading their Bible, only 32% of Christians will pick up and read their Bible on a daily basis. 40% will read it once a week or not at all. When it comes to tithing, the statistics have not changed over years and years and years of church history. Only 10 to 20% of people who say that they follow Jesus Christ actually tithe. If we were simply to look at just those three categories, does our righteousness today exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees? It doesn't even come close. I want you to think about what Jesus said the consequence of falling short of the bar is. The consequence of falling short of the bar is this, is that you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Those are harsh words. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. But I want you to think about the implications of what Jesus is saying because Jesus isn't looking at the people and mercilessly saying you're never going to make it. He's trying to make a very clear point to them. And the point is this. The first implication is your righteousness will never be enough. There is no way 
that you can be so righteous and follow these rules to the point that you will be good enough to earn your way into heaven. If it's not clear, when Jesus says your righteousness has to be greater than the scribes and Pharisees, it should tell you the scribes and Pharisees, not even they in their righteousness are getting in because your righteousness needs to be greater. Jesus makes the point that your righteousness uh, will never be enough. But number two, that God wants something more from you than just your righteous actions. Where they are not good enough, there is something that God desires. And number three, what it is, God wants your heart. And you can see it in the words that Jesus speaks against the Pharisees. If you look back again with me at Matthew chapter 23, verse 28, in his condemnation of the Pharisees, what does he say? He says, outwardly you look righteous. You look like you have it all together. But what? Inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. There's a sickness in your heart that separates you from God. And no matter how hard you try to be good, what actually separates you is something that resides inside of your heart. What God desires is our hearts. And this should have been clear from the Old Testament. This isn't something new that Jesus instituted. You actually see that what the Pharisees had done for the people is distorted the teaching of the law. Because all throughout the Old Testament, you see this teaching that we'll look at together in Psalm chapter 51, verses 16 through 17. David has sinned. David has committed sin with Bathsheba. Nathan has confronted him. He is repenting before the Lord. And listen to the word that David speaks. He says, you will not delight God in sacrifice, right? The Old Testament sacrificial system, you sin, you kill an animal, and so that your sin can be forgiven and covered over, right? He says, God, I know that you won't delight in sacrifice or else I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering, but the sacrifices of God, as David knew, are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. What David and the people of the Old Testament understood and the distortion that Jesus is fixing is this, is that the law was never meant to be a means of achieving favor or salvation. The law's purpose was to reveal our sinfulness, for us to be able to see how holy God is and how far we fall short of God's holiness. But it also, as it reveals our sinfulness, it reveals to us our desperate need for God, that we can never be righteous enough, and so we need God to save us. But not only that, it displays for us this beautiful picture of God's grace. Even in the Old Testament law, God had provided a way for the forgiveness of sin. It showed his grace. And why? So that our hearts would be drawn to him. As we consider this truth of what Jesus is teaching, I want us together this morning to consider the destructiveness of a rules-based relationship. Because it truly is destructive to our lives and especially to our walk with God, but also to the lives of people that we allow to think that this is the way the Christian life is supposed to be lived. Consider the destructiveness. Next fill in. It can give you a very false sense of security. For some people, when they come to the Christian life, they think to themselves, all right, I prayed this prayer of salvation. I'm going to do some good deeds, try to be a good person. Nah, I'm going to live the ways of the world, but basically I'm in. I've got my fire insurance. It's what we would call living a checklist Christianity. It's the idea that I've got this list of things that I follow, and if I do them well enough, then somehow I'm in. Now, how many of you guys like checklists? Anybody here like making checklists? One of the things that I do every Monday morning after staff prayers, I go into my office, I sit down with a pad of paper or my iPad, and I start Start writing out the to-do list of what's going to come in the week. And this is the one that I used last week. I sit, and one of the things that I love about having a checklist like this, you may be able to relate to this, is I love nothing more than being able to finish something and actually cross it off. Doesn't it feel so, how many of you guys, when you cross something off checklist, feels so good, doesn't it? Amen. Praise Jesus. I'll tell you what's even better is when you forgot to put something on the checklist and you finish it, and then you write it down and you cross it off, just, just so you can have that feeling, right? Praise God. Look, I'm not alone in this room. I love it. We love checklists. Why? Why do I love checklists? It gives me a sense of achievement. I got the job done. It keeps me on track. And many Christians live their life this way. We go to church. We read a little. We pray a little. We give a little. We serve a little. We try to be good people. 
We believe that somehow this accomplishment of tasks is earning us favor with God. And I believe from my own experience growing up in the church, and maybe some of you have a similar experience, that the church at large in America has done over years and years a disservice to young people, to children, to youth, by not helping them to understand the truth about what a relationship with Jesus, when he calls us to follow, is really meant to be. Because often what we have done is we have focused so heavily on the rules of what you should or should not do, telling people how they should live, less on the relationship and the beautiful relationship God wants to have with us to the point that we come with a distorted view of what it means to walk with God. What's wrong with it? I want you to remember this. A checklist without a heart change is like giving a corpse a facelift. It may look a little bit better on the outside, but it is still dead on the inside. This was Jesus' condemnation to the Pharisees. You look great on the outside, but on the inside, you are dead. Consider the destructiveness of a rules-based relationship because it can give you a very false sense of security where you live in pride, believing that you've got it all together because you're getting the list done. But for other people, it can leave them never knowing where they really stand with God. And I have talked to so many Christians about this, especially when you know what the checklist is, but you also know that you aren't quite getting it done. Where's the bar? Have I done enough, God? Is there more that I should be doing? Have I been failing you in some way? And when it leaves you not knowing where you stand with God, it often will lead you to never feeling as though you are quite good enough for the Lord. I can't begin to tell you the number of conversations I have had in my years in ministry, whether it was as a youth pastor with young people or with some of the oldest saints who wrestle with the idea of, I just can't overcome my sin. I don't seem to be performing well enough. And they wrestle in this life of believing that they aren't good enough for God. Not only have I had those conversations with people, but that was my own experience growing up in the church. In high school, moving even into early college, even into my early years of pastoring, though I knew the truth of what Scripture taught, ingrained in me was this belief that if I don't follow the rules, I'm not good enough. If I don't follow the rules perfectly, then God is not pleased with me. And I knew that for me... I was not good at reading my Bible on a daily basis. I hated to read. I didn't pray regularly, at least as much as I should have been. I struggled with sin, and I always kept doing the things that I didn't want to do, but I just kept doing them. And I had this picture in my mind where I believed that God looked at me with eyes of disdain, that he was constantly disappointed to the point that I would even begin to question my own salvation. And the truth is, is that when we live according to a checklist Christianity, it can leave you in a place where you don't feel good enough. And that discouragement will often lead you to one of four things. It can lead you to a place of complacency where you just stop trying. It can lead you to a place of abject fear where you live your life. And I have talked to so many people and I've been there myself where you live in fear that your destiny is separation from God in hell and not with him in heaven. It can lead you to a place of giving up, saying I might as well not even try. Number four, and I see this in the church at large in America, it also can lead you to creating your own belief about what God desires. If I can't meet the bar, I might as well lower it and allow myself to believe that that's sufficient. What I think is interesting, remember here, is that Jesus says so clearly in this passage in verses 17 through 19 that the law doesn't pass away. He's not removing it. The law is still there. We don't have the authority to lower the bar. But often that's what happens. And why? Because a rules-based relationship is not what God designed for us to live. And it is destructive to our lives. But I want you to consider in comparison this morning what Jesus was trying to correct. And it is this. I want you to consider the beauty of the relationship that God has designed for you. 
Think of the beauty of the relationship that God has designed for you. And it is this, that where your righteousness fails, Christ's is enough. When we read in the scriptures, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he says, For our sake, he being God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What Paul is helping us to understand is that the very reason that God sent Jesus into this world is so that he could come, living a perfect life, being the perfect sacrifice for sin, that he would go to the cross and die there in my place and in your place, taking our sin away. That he would literally pay the punishment that was due to us, taking our sin upon himself. But the beauty of what Paul describes is not just that he paid the penalty, But he gives the idea of what is called imputed righteousness. That when Jesus takes our sin on the cross, he also gives us his righteousness in its place. The beauty of that is that when God looks at you, follower of Jesus Christ, he doesn't see a failure who can't measure up. He doesn't see a person who keeps screwing up and who can't ever quite get it right. The scriptures say that when God looks at you as a follower of Jesus Christ, that he sees the blood of his son covering your sin and he sees his son's righteousness in your life. That is the most beautiful gift that we could ever be given. And that is the relationship that you have been invited into, that you can never be good enough, but Jesus was and he is. Amen? Amen. Non-believer here in this room today, I want you to understand the beauty of this truth. The Christian life is not about just living by a set of rules and trying to be a good person. It's about living in a loving relationship with God because he has shown the depth of how much he loves us and how much he loves you. Christian in the room who may have been struggling in some way, shape, or form with checklist Christianity, whether it's living with pride, believing that somehow you are this really great Christian, or whether it's wrestling in the dirt with the muck of your life and believing you can't be good enough. This truth that where your righteousness fails, Christ is enough, is a call to understand the depth of God's love for you. Number two, you can have complete confidence in God's love for you. That's why we as a church talk about the fact that our vision as a church, as a group of followers of Jesus Christ, is to be a Jesus-centered community that is known for sharing God's love with our neighbors and with the nations. It's the reason that we encourage you to go out and to share the story of what God has done in your life. It's why Mindy Cross stands up here to share what God is doing in her life and how God is moving because we're going out into areas in our community sharing with people the good news of the truth that it's not the Christian life is not about living by a set of rules it's about living in a loving relationship with God and the reason that those rules are important it's because it's the way that we express our love for all that he has done to save us and then number three the beauty of this relationship is that God transforms your life It's not that you have to work so hard to earn favor but God transforms your life as you give him your heart and truly love him So what do I do with my checklist? What do we do with our checklist? I would encourage you, as I believe Jesus does, as he comes to correct this false thinking, that what we actually need to do is to think differently about our checklist. I'll close with this. Submission to what God wants for our lives is to flow naturally out of our relationship with him. It's not to say that what we do or don't do doesn't matter because it does. But what we do or don't do must come from who we are as followers of Jesus Christ who deeply love him. A week ago, Rochelle and I got back from spending uh, time away celebrating our 20th wedding anniversary. Uh, It was actually back in November, and we kind of postponed our trip and took it just a week ago. It was a great time to get away. But when I think about marrying Rochelle, when I got married, one of the things that took place is that there were some rules on that wedding day that I said that I would live by. The rules were written and they were spelled out for me. I recited them in front of all of our friends and family that were gathered together. And when I said, I do, I understood that I was committing to keeping certain rules within my marriage relationship. I promised Rochelle 
that I would be faithful to her as long as we both lived. I promised her that day that I would provide for her, that I would meet her physical needs, her emotional needs, her spiritual needs. I promised to protect her with my life. And I promised to be committed to her for better or worse, for richer, most likely poorer, sickness and in health. But here's what happened. After I got married, I soon discovered that there's other rules that aren't covered on that day. You guys know what I'm talking about. And these rules have been clearly established since that day. Rules like, I am to keep my clothes off of the middle of the floor, even if I think I'm going to put them back on in the morning. There is only one person in our, room, in our house that can plunge a toilet, and apparently that is me. There are rules like this, that if you interrupt a Hallmark movie, it will absolutely cost you dearly. If I'm listening to Rochelle talk and I'm trying to watch SportsCenter or surf the internet, it is the same thing as an emotional affair. When she asks for my opinion on paint colors, the only correct answer is, what do you think, honey? And when get, amen. And when guests or family are coming over, cleaning the house does not mean picking things up. It has its own set of stringent pharisaical midrash to follow. Now, if I saw our relationship as a bunch of rules that I had to keep, if I lived my life that way, I would quickly become bitter and probably very miserable and dissatisfied in my marriage. I would likely rebel and break the rules, especially when she wasn't looking. But I am passionately in love with Rochelle. And what that translates into is a desire to please her in every way I can. And the truth is, I fail miserably. There are so many times where I am not the husband that I should be. But she has the love and the grace to continue this journey with me and to love me unconditionally. And that makes me love her even more. Submission to what God wants for our lives flows naturally out of our relationship with him. It's not to say that what we do or don't do doesn't matter because it does. But what we do or don't do doesn't come because we have to follow a set of rules. It comes because it is the expression of our love for our Savior. Why do I read God's word each day? Not because I have to. It's because I know. I want to know the God who loves me. Why do I pray every day? Not because I have to, because my strength comes from God. Why do I go to church? Not because I have to, but because I get to worship him and do life with other believers in the way that he designed so that I can experience the fullness of this life that God has given to me. Why do I strive to abstain from sin? Not because I have to, but because it pleases my Savior when I do. Why do I serve others? Not because I have to, because I want to be like Jesus. Why do I tell other people about Jesus and share my faith? It's not because I have to. It's because I want them to know my Savior who loves them, who gave his life for them, and that they would know the promise of eternal life that I myself personally know. Why do I do all these things and more? Not because it's a checklist. Not because it's a set of rules that I have to follow. But because I am so in love with Jesus because he has proven his love for me. That is the relationship that we are called into when Jesus invites us to follow him. Rules or relationship? The choice is ours. Choose the best that God has for you. Let's pray. God, you're good. Your word is rich. And Father, I thank you for how in your word you have made so clear to us what it means to follow you. I thank you that you sent Jesus into this world, especially to correct the thinking that was so wrong. I thank you, Lord, that you've made abundantly clear that we don't have to earn our way to you. But that, Father, what you invite us into is one of the greatest relationships this world has ever known. Where even in our failure, we are loved so deeply by you. To the point that you would look at us and call us your children. Father, I pray that this morning as we have studied and read your word, that the work that you would do is that you would reveal to us in our life the ways in which, Father, maybe we have lived with pride 
in the way that we live out our faith. We think we've accomplished something great because we're following the rules. In that situation, God, remind us of just how much we have to accomplish to be that great. We can't do it. Humble us, Father. Teach us to love people deeply from our hearts. God, I pray that for those of us that struggle in this area of feeling like we're good enough, teach us and remind us, Lord, that we don't have to be. That, Father, you sent your son into this world because we weren't good enough. And that when we place our faith in you, that his righteousness becomes our own. And teach us, Father, that in our striving to, quote, follow the rules, the law that doesn't pass away, that we are doing so not because we're earning salvation or earning favor, but it's a response of our heart to you because we are so in love with you because of who you are and what you have done for us. And Father, I pray that you would teach us as we go from here today to not only live our lives, but to use our words in such a way that a world that is looking in at the church and wondering what it is all about would have a true understanding that it isn't about just following a set of rules, but following you is about entering into a loving relationship where you have given everything for us. And in turn, what we do is a result of our worship of you. Father, would you draw people to know you because of it? So Holy Spirit, speak into our hearts and our lives. Transform us, change us, and use us to be a testimony to this world. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. I want to let you know that, uh, again, our prayer room is open for you today. Here, if you're here on site, you can go out these doors and to the right. If God has been speaking to your heart this morning in one of these areas, I would love for you to just stop by the prayer room and pray with one of our elders or deaconesses that are there. We would love to just pray with you and seal what God has been speaking into your heart today. Maybe you have a physical need or a special need that you would like prayer for. They are there to pray with you for that as well. Those of you that are at home online watching, I would encourage you, if you have a prayer need and would like an elder or a deaconess to contact you today, you you can send your prayer requests to prayer at westgatechapel.org and we would love the opportunity to pray with you today as well. Church family, again, as you leave, you can give your offerings at the back. Those are there for you. But my heart and my challenge for you is that you would walk out just overwhelmed by the depth of God's love for you, remembering that this Christian life, this following of Jesus is not about living by the set of rules. It's about living in a loving, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, where everything that we do is a response to his love for us. God bless you. Have a fantastic week serving the Lord. Speed.